Welcome to a care collab for the general care of the genus Myrmecophila. I appreciate your time and I hope that this video will maybe make you decide to buy any of these gorgeous orchids in this genus if you were put off by their size and your conditions may not have been quite right and you think that you can't grow them mounted because your conditions, your environment is not inviting for that kind of a setup. Well, you've come to the right place and I hope that after I have spoken to you about how I care for mine that you are going to say, okay, I'm going to give this a go. Oh, and also in case you have yours mounted and it's not really working out for you, maybe you might want to consider something along the lines of self-watering. In my case, I do it with inorganic media, specifically LECA. However, we have several other channels participating and their links will be in the description if you care to see how they take care of their Myrmecophilas. Maybe there are other alternatives there for you. First of all, I can't help myself with this genus and I want to get it out of my system because it's one of the quirkiest and funkiest little fun facts about Myrmecophila. And it just feels so fitting for this genus that I have to say, it's all a little Greek to me. <laughs> I had to put that in there. I'm sorry because the pun is intended. The genus name itself derives from the Greek Myrmex which means an and philos which translates into friend. So when you translate that it's pretty obvious the genus is called ant friend and I just love that because the quirk of this orchid is that the pseudobulbs are hollow inside to a degree and they provide an inviting home for ants because where Myrmecophila grow naturally as lithophytes or epiphytes their source of fertilizer is pretty scarce and the ant secretions bringing in decayed matter for building their nests inside the pseudobulbs is the main source of fertilizer for these orchids. Even the dead bodies of ants provide a great source of nutrients. This is an incredible harmony of I'll cook for you for a roof over my head in the natural sense. So wait, before you go inspecting your Mimicophila to see if it has any ants in it or you're gonna say, well, no, that's it. I'm not interested to bring an orchid in that's going to be attracting ants. Well, hold off before you click off this video because not every Myrmecophila will have an ant in it, especially in cultivation. Meanwhile, it can happen. Myrmecophila don't need ants to survive. It's just the fact that they are ready to do so if an ant colony wants to come in, but it's not a requirement for them to grow well and thrive. But it's amazing because out in their natural habitat, you can say that the Myrmecophilas are the great recyclers because they utilize the garbage dump which ants accumulate in the pseudobulbs, which are hollow to some degree. So can you just imagine? In cultivation, our Myrmecophilas are eating in a Michelin star establishment because of the fertilizer we give them. It is a well-balanced, nutritious diet, and they are not dependent on the garbage of ants. <laughs> Speaking of fertilizer, when my Myrmecophilas are in active growth, straight away they get 300 parts per million, which is the maximum parts per million I allow throughout my entire collection, but that doesn't mean it only happens once a week. These guys are thirsty and they require a lot of fertilizer. So once they've absorbed their reservoir, they get another 300 parts per million and that can happen twice a week depending on how quickly the orchid absorbs the reservoir. In between, every time I fill their reservoir, I flush them through abundantly with plain RO water before filling the reservoir again. So it could be that my orchids get flushed two times a week plus get the fertilizer two times a week and and that is in active growth which I always include roots into that category of active growth. Just because a new growth might have finished growing doesn't mean that the orchid is now resting, especially when it is an active root growth. I also supplement with calcium and magnesium, but because my fertilizer has calcium and magnesium in it, I usually go with 100 parts per million of calcium and magnesium, and I don't really have a regulation for that. When I think about it, I'll give them a dose of calcium and magnesium instead of fertilizer, but 
that doesn't happen every week. If I were to guess, it's about every three or four weeks because if the rest of the collection is getting calcium and magnesium, then my Myrmecophila will also get that. Having not been so heavy-handed on the calcium and magnesium front, I have not seen any deficiencies on my orchids, so my fertilizer is doing the job at 300 parts per million when in active growth. Of course, when not in active growth, I do not fertilize at all, but I do flush very, very often, especially the Tibicinus on the right, because that one is in a semi-hydro setup, and I'll get to that, but I do flush very often because these orchids, when in active growth, should never really ever dry out. When they're not in active growth, of course, the watering gets reduced a little bit, but not by much because of my media being lecker. I don't want my lecker to lose its wicking efficacy, and for that reason, I always maintain a level of dampness to the microfibers, especially in the self-watering setup. And there will always be a little, little something in the reservoir of the Tibicinus. So let me introduce you to my Myrmecophilus that I have here. Specifically, let me get the Francis Fox out of the way. She's a hybrid. She has Myrmecophila Tibicinus, which is here on the right as a parent. So that's why I put her into the picture. She pretty much gets the same care as my Myrmecophila Thomsoniana, which is tucked in the back and should now come into the spotlight. Just wanted to show you the Francis Fox because of the parentage. And here is Myrmecophila Thomsoniana on the left and Myrmecophila Tibicinus on the right. So I'm going to discuss with you now my setup and the reasoning behind it because these guys love their humidity. I am here in southern Spain and where they come from in Mexico, Central America, the West Indies and Venezuela, they get 80% humidity throughout the majority of the year. Here they get 30% on average throughout the majority of the year. And for that reason, as much as I like seeing these orchids specifically mounted because they make a fabulous statement on a mount, but if I don't have the humidity and these guys should never really ever dry out, I am going to really struggle growing these orchids on the mount. Hence, lecker and self-watering. Every single pot gives me a little margin of humidity around the leaves. Humidity is provided for the perimeter of the pot. The thing is, there is no difference between what I'm doing with the self-watering on the left of the Thompsoniana and the semi-hydro on the right of the Tibicinus. I treat them both the same way. The only reason the Tibicinus is in a semi-hydro setup is because of how it grows. It is much, much flatter, more spread out. For that reason, I bought a little bowl for it. Well, a big bowl for it <laughs> because this orchid, even though the rhizome is pretty, pretty tight, it doesn't have a long rambling rhizome. You can see how it is flat up against the media. And semi-hydro is much, much easier. I can just pour water over the top of the orchid, let it drain out. Now, when I'm fertilizing, I'm a little bit more vigilant. I don't just pour the water through. I make sure that I go and fill up the reservoir without having the fertilizer touch the leaves, simply because, once again, my very dry climate will cause everything to evaporate quickly and suddenly I have water blemishes with salt incrustations on my leaves. But the setup of Lekka and self-watering is helping me tremendously to get through the really hot, dry months of the year while these orchids need a lot of water and also to help with the humidity. There's one thing though I have to say about the setup for the Tibicinus. This poor orchid has been through the ringer and that is why I'm going to bring it up so that I can warn you in advance. The way she is positioned in the pot is now the third time in as many years that she has to be positioned into the pot again. I actually had her rooted in last year and then this year <laughs> she was outside getting her full sunshine shine, but without me knowing it, a massive windstorm came through. I was not home. When I came home, I saw my Tibicinus up against, hooked into the hedge. She had been blown, ripped out of her pot by the wind. Little side note for anybody who's interested, the orchid was high enough off the ground and the pups were indoors. The doors were closed. There was no way anything else dealt with that orchid than the wind. It was just, oh, at least she wasn't broken. So what you see now in the pot 
is my Tibby Sinus once again just lying on the media and very, very far away from any aggressive wind so she doesn't blow out again. So I am not surprised I haven't seen any blooms yet. The upright growth habit of my Thompsoniana is ideal because you can see she looks much better in a pot. That would not work long term for the Tibby Sinus, hence the different setups. Pretty much though, when it comes to light, even though the Tibicinus has a lot of anthocyanin and the Thompsoniana not so much, they get the maximum amount of light that I can throw at them and that includes direct sun. I pushed my Tibicinus to extremes and I experienced some sunburn. Okay, now I know, not that much light, but she gets a lot of light. Especially during the winter, what I try to do with them is I bring them in and out whenever the sun is shining during the winter and I just plonk them into direct sunshine. And that is where Tibicinus was located <laughs> in direct sunshine, where the wind was the strongest. You could call it tornado alley because when that wind hits hard, for some reason it swirls in my patio. But the reason she was positioned there was because direct sun all the time as long as possible without burning the leaves. So the Tibicinus did burn and now in the summers I have her on the lower shelf of the east facing rack when I move her to the east side when the temperatures are warm enough. My Thompsoniana is always always on the top shelf of my blooming alley in a corner where the curtain won't be covering because the curtain doesn't fit that gap too well. So that orchid gets sun at least eight hours a day whereas the Tibicinus now would get direct sun six hours a day. So these orchids can really take a beating. They are tough. They are not the delicate little pansies to worry about. I have not seen any setback per se with all the disruption of my Tibicinus, but maybe that is why I don't have blooms yet. Because yes, I have disrupted my Thompsoniana on the left as well since she's been with me, but that was by choice and not by accident. So I've never had the privilege of seeing the massive bloom spikes and the gorgeous, slightly fragrant blooms. The bloom spikes, I would love to experience how these guys grow. They can be up to a meter to four meters long <laughs> and take about four months to develop. So um, whenever you guys are ready, I'm ready, this I have to see. So no blooms for me just yet and maybe no blooms this year either because I have to do something about the Thompsoniana. She has to go into a bigger pot because they are not shy growers. Now we are outside in my blooming alley. It's a covered portico, but this is just for filming purposes. When it comes to temperature, a lot of the time in the winter, these two orchids will be brought out specifically to this location because of the angle of the sun and they get a lot of light here. But the temperatures here are also a little bit more milder than what they would like to tolerate during the winters. And in their grow space, when I cannot bring the orchids outside, their temperature can go down to 14 degrees. I don't like it that low, but it would appear that they are temperature tolerant and they are okay. I don't have any signs of cold damage per se on these orchids. Their highs, well, as hot as it can get. These are hot growers. My rare 40 degrees maximum temperatures that I get here, I wouldn't even flinch. I still don't take them out of the sunshine when it gets that hot. But what I do is go around and miss them a lot because usually when I get those high temperatures, when they're maxed out like that, my humidity is around 10%. So yeah, you can imagine. That is not a good thing if you don't want any leaves or anything to burn into oregano. I do miss them a lot during the months of June, July, August, and sometimes into September. And you can see, after mentioning how much water these guys need, on top of that, no, I miss them. The 80% humidity that they would prefer, <laughs> I can only dream of. Needless to say, at some point, my Thompsoniana is going to get a repot. And then hopefully, maybe, in 2023, we can get some blooms out of these two. My Frances Fox that I showed earlier, she blooms regularly for me, and the Mimicophila is so strong in her that her light levels also can be super, super high. The Cattleya polka dot parent doesn't even feature. It's all about the Myrmecophila kind of care. The leaves look much more flimsy, not as waxy and sturdy, but they can also take quite the beating from the sun without burning. I hope that I've covered everything. If you are in doubt about growing this genus or you've got it mounted and aren't coping, 
give self-watering a go. You can also do that with lava rock if you don't like lacquer as a media per se. Give it a go because it's working for me, except for the fact that I haven't had blooms yet. But yes, I have been disturbing these orchids <laughs> a little bit too much. On one hand, repotting and dividing, and on the other hand, being ripped out of its pot, <laughs> literally blown out of its pot unceremoniously <laughs> into a hedge several times since I've got it. Um, oops. <laughs> We'll try to avoid that from here on in. If you have any questions, if I didn't circle back on a thought, the comments are there for a reason and I would be happy to elaborate, clarify or even finish a thought. <laughs> Thank you to all the channels participating. I appreciate your time. Thank you so, so much for watching my video. I appreciate you being here. Have yourselves a fabulous day on one condition though, that you please stay safe and take care. Bye! Oh, just one more thing. If you're still a little bit squeamish about the ant subject right at the beginning of the video, let me tell you something. Put your mind at rest. I had so many ants in the growing season of 2021. Ants everywhere. Not a single one in these two pots. <laughs> of all places. Just wanted to add that on for what it's worth. If it changes your mind. Bye! Bye!